In this video, I'm going to talk about parametric equations. Parametric equations are just a different way to represent a line. And I shouldn't just say a line, a different way to represent a curve. Different way to represent a curve. They always have some x equals and a y equals and sometimes a z equals if that curve is three-dimensional. And it's always in terms of one parameter. So one parameter, one variable. T is used a lot. So you'll see x equals and it'll have some function of t or y equals and it'll have some function of t. All right, so here's an example. y equals x squared. We could rewrite this as x equals t and y equals t squared where t is everything. So if I look at this and say, well, x is equal to t, so if I plug in that t is equal to x, and here I get y equals x squared. So this is just a different way to represent a curve. And the whole reason why we would ever want to do this is parametric equations give motion to a curve. So they not only say we've got y equals x squared, but they say we're going to move along y equals x squared starting at a certain point and then ending at a certain point. So let me give some examples to that. So let's, um, on this one, we are going to eliminate Eliminate the parameter um, to find the Cartesian equation and then uh, graph, graph the motion of a particle um, moving along the path. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you two different examples that we're going to kind of do, well maybe not simultaneously, but I'm going to look at these on the same page so that you can can compare. Um, and a couple of things in here, so because you're probably wondering what a Cartesian equation is. So Cartesian equation means write the equation y equals some function of x. So we're going to have parametric equations in terms of a variable and we want to switch it to be some equation y equals in terms of a function x. Okay, so uh, first example, let's say that x is equal to t cubed and y is equal to t to the sixth um, and t in this case goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. Notice I've included bounds on all of these. Parametric equations include bounds. That's really important because that's what gives the motion. Alright, so Eliminating the parameter, t cubed is equal to x, and if we look at y, y would be equal to t cubed times t cubed, and t cubed was equal to x, and so we get y equals x squared. So we get this parabola. All right, we haven't graphed any motion yet. Let's look at the next example just a little bit. So on this next example, I want to set x equal to t squared and y equal to t to the fourth, where t goes from negative infinity to infinity. And so if we eliminate the parameter again, and in this case, y is equal to t to the 
squared times t squared. t squared is equal to x, and we once again get y equals x squared. Once again, so notice that we got y equals x squared out of two different parameterizations. And there are infinitely many parameterizations for a single curve. You can kind of switch the variables around. Um, so, you know, if I say parameterize, you may get something different from your friend and you both may still be correct. Okay, so now this motion graphing the motion of the particle. So if I plugged in, I'm just going to plug in some values. So let's start with t being negative over here, and maybe let's just start with t equals negative 2. When t equals negative 2, x is going to equal negative, what's that, negative 8. And so if I put that onto this line, that's like, I don't know, maybe over here is x equals negative 8. Then when t equals negative 1, x is going to be negative 1. So I've gone from there to there. Then when t equals 0, x equals 0. So now I've gone to x equals 0. When t equals 1, x equals 1 gone from there, now to there, and you can see that what would happen is that the motion of the particle along this parabola is going to start way up here at infinity. It's going to travel down the parabola until it hits zero, and then it's going to travel back up the parabola. For every value of t, you get a different point on that parabola. For every value of t, you get a different point on the parabola. Alright, so for this next one, if we do the exact same thing, we're going to pick different values of t. So let's do the same ones. When t is equal to negative 2, in this case, we're squaring it, so x is going to equal uh, 4. So x equals 4 when t equals negative 2. Then when t equals negative 1, x equals positive 1. That's right there. So we just went from that point to that point. Then when t equals 0, x equals 0. So now we go from that point to the origin. Then when t equals 1, x equals 1. So now we go back up. We go back up to that point at 1. And then when t equals 2, x equals again. So now we're going back up to that point of 4. So this particle, it doesn't even hit that part of the graph. What is described by this second problem is the motion of something going down the parabola on the positive side, hitting 0, and then going back up that exact same side of the parabola. All right, so the moral of the story on this problem is that with one different, if we just said y equals x squared, well, then that's just a parabola. But now with parametric equations, we now have motion. And not only do we have motion, but we have different, we can describe what a particle does in different situations, even along the same curve. Okay, so that's just kind of a little bit of like why we would even want to study parametric equations. Um, and where this is going is in Calc 3, you are going to be finding the work that a particle does in moving along some kind of a curve, just like this, but with some sort of a force field against it. That's sort of what you'll get to at the end of Calculus 3. Okay, so let's do some more examples of some parameterization. Um, and let's just find some, some parametric representations. So find the parametric equations.
four. Um, first of all, let's look at the line y equals 8x plus 5. Um, so if we wanted to parametize this, now remember a parametization, it's an x equals and a y equals. I always write that down first. Now I already have an y equals, so let's just use it. I'll, I'll switch the parameter to t and set x equal to t, although we could just keep x equal to x and then y equal to 8x plus 5, and that would be fine. I haven't specified anything on this line um, as far as uh, restrictions on it, and so t would be everything. So a particle would just move along the line. Now, what if we did specify? So, what if we want to start at 0, 5, and end at, um, end at, let's say, 1, and, well, we could do 2, 2, 21. Um, so in this case, the, the parametization will be the same. We'll still have x equals t and y equals 8t plus 5. But in this one, the motion of the particle is it has to start somewhere and it has to end somewhere. And our x's are going to be kind of key to that. Because we want to find the bounds on t, and t is equal to x, x starts at 0 and it ends at 2. And notice that if I plug in 0 into these equations, then I get x equals 0 and y equals 5. The end point, so we're going to go through all values of t, but we're going to stop when t is equal to 2. And when t is equal to 2, x is equal to 2, and y is equal to 16 plus 5, and that would be 21. Let's look at another example. Let's find the parametric representations for x squared plus y squared equals 4. And if the particle is moving clockwise, uh, moving clockwise once around the circle. Alright, so the whole reason that I brought up polar coordinates in the last video is for these types of problems. Parametric equations are very useful with circles because of the equation of a circle has x squared and y squared. Parametric equations can be a lot easier to deal with in certain places. So parametric equations, we need an x equals, we need a y equals, and then we'll have to worry about bounds. Now remember that polar coordinates, x was equal to r cosine of theta. We're going to use that. And in this case, r is equal to 2 cosine theta. And y would be r, which is 2 sine of theta. So in this case, I don't use t as my parameter. I'm using theta. You can use t if you want to. And theta, because it's a whole circle, is going to go from 0 to um, 2 pi. Now remember in polar coordinates that theta equals 0 started at the positive x-axis and then went around that way. That way is counterclockwise. And so if you use polar coordinates, then clockwise, or counterclockwise, I'm sorry, and I meant to put this counter, counterclockwise, um, you can just use polar coordinates. Okay, now let's look at what would happen if it was clockwise. So clockwise, instead of going counterclockwise, you want it to go around in a circle like a clock, and 
you know, I'm actually going to, oops, erased a little bit more than I wanted to there. Um, I'm going to redraw this line, but I'm going to start at where zero actually starts. Zero starts at 12 o'clock, just like a clock does, um, and then goes clockwise. So mm, clockwise theta does start differently. So theta equals zero for clockwise. And if I want to do clockwise, I all I have to do is switch the cosine and the sine. And y equals to cosine. Because look at what happens when we plug in some values for theta. If we plug in theta equals zero, when theta equals zero, sine of zero is zero, and so x is zero. When theta is equal to zero, cosine of zero is one, and x is two. And that is the point zero, two, it's right there, that's where it starts. So right there is theta equals zero. When theta equals pi over two, sine of pi over two is one, so that's two. Cosine of pi over two is uh, zero. And so now we have moved around the circle to the point two, zero. Notice that that's clockwise. Notice where theta equals zero is. And so by switching the sine and the cosine, I can then, I can then move the particle clockwise instead of counterclockwise. Um, I haven't written down bounds yet. So a full circle. Oh, let's switch this one. Let's do clockwise um, with a half a circle. Um, and let's do... Ooh, let's do the top half. All right, so if we're going to do the top half of the circle, that includes all of that part, and it has to move clockwise. So it needs to start there and end there. Theta equals zero is at the top of the circle there. And we already found that its end point, so where it would end, would be at pi over 2. So it is going to start a quarter of a circle back from pi over 2, which would be negative pi over 2. So it starts at negative pi over 2. It hits every angle through 0 all the way until it ends at theta equals pi over 2. Once again, clockwise is not using polar coordinates. It kind of uses more motion like a clock, where zero is, is on the y-axis. Zero is at 12 o'clock. Um, whereas counterclockwise, just use polar coordinates, and zero starts just like polar coordinates does.